everybody um, and welcome to another one of our member-led fireside chats over Zoom. Uh, thank you very much for joining us all this morning. I hope you had a fabulous week so far. So excited that it's only a four-day week. Um, this morning I'm super excited to welcome you to Daniela Flores who is an Albright member. She has been, I think she's been with us since nearly the beginning. She's certainly been with Albright for longer than I have worked for Albright. Um, and I actually remember my first day was an event with Daniela in the club. Today we are going to be discussing how, how important is purpose in today's world? And I certainly feel uh, the purpose is coming into the conversation a lot more as people have more time to think and have more time at home to kind of realign with what, what their purpose is and what, what their business's purposes are. Um, and we're gonna learn all about it today. In terms of our usual fireside chat protocol, I'd like to suggest we have a, Daniela's presented or put together a fantastic slide, but um, if you would like to change, if you would like to put your video on where we could see your faces, um, everybody needs some friendly faces at this time, please do, but also equally don't feel pressured to. Um, we also ask that you do keep your microphone on mute throughout the talk. Um, this just, um, avoids any background noise or speaking over one another. Um, but if you do have a question, we, we want to take them all, please do put them in the chat box below and we will get to them at the end of the session. The session will last approximately 30 minutes. Um, and yeah, enjoy, I'll hand over to Daniela. Great, thanks so much, Courtney. Um, and welcome everyone, good morning. I can see some friendly faces there. So thank you very much for turning your videos on. Um, I'm Daniela Flores. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Purpose Union, which is a social purpose consultancy. Um, we work with a lot of organizations to help them to define their purpose, um, create a narrative around that, build campaigns, um, help business leaders talk about their purpose both internally and externally, and take a stand on some of the big social issues of the moment. We work with startups, philanthropists, um, through to foundations, large NGOs, um, public and private sector companies, um, including FTSE list corporates as well. So we've got kind of an experience across the gamut. And I know in today's session, there's a lot of people um, with different backgrounds. So hopefully um, what I say will be interesting and relevant for you all. Um, I think we've probably all heard the word purpose for, for a while now. It's been on the agenda definitely for the last couple of the years. Um, and I think now it's, it's more important than ever, as, as Courtney says, it's, it's interesting times, difficult times for a lot of people. Um, and I think this is a really good time to talk about purpose, um, both our individual purpose, but also our professional purpose and how that fits in with the wider business context and um, society as well. So today I'd like to talk a bit about um, how purpose can help us during this difficult time, both to get through it, but also hopefully to create a better world on the other side. Uh, sorry, get my slide. So, um, I think uh, where we're at now in terms of the current situation, I think obviously priorities have changed for individuals and businesses. Uh, we've seen a real shift in business models. Everyone's kind of moving from, from physical to virtual. Everything's online at the moment. Um, uh, there's a new style of leadership. We're uh, managing teams remotely in lots of different locations um, and different systems and ways of communicating. Um, I can't remember how many apps I'm now on, Zoom and Slack and House Party, um, in order to stay connected with everyone. Um, and I think most importantly, the focus has really shifted to that sense of community and helping others. And it's not just about thinking about your personal interests or business profits at the moment, which I think is really important. Um, but it is a difficult time, obviously, you know, especially for those on the front line, um, the NHS workers and, and other workers who are doing an amazing job. Uh, but it's also a difficult time for, for freelancers, for, for small business owners, entrepreneurs, um, in a lot of sectors, especially those in hospitality and leisure. Um, and I think hopefully this sort of sense of purpose is important for, for all of those people to kind of think about where, where we're at now and where we go forward. Um, so, uh, so what now? We've had a challenging month. Um, I think we've had three weeks of lockdown and probably now another three weeks to come uh, by the sounds of things. Um, so we're probably out of survival mode to a certain extent. We've settled in some sort of routine. Everyone's, I think, adjusted to working from home, um, set up homeschooling. And um, the reason why we wanted to do the seminar now is because we thought it'd be a good moment for pause and reflection. Um, this is a quote from Churchill, uh, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I think in this context, it's less sort of about um, 
being opportunistic, but it's really about turning a crisis into an opportunity. And I think the outcome depends really on how you um, react to the current circumstances. And rather than seeing it as a time of disruption and interruption, use it for reflection and introspection. Um, and I think we should really take the opportunity to think about how we want to live our lives and hopefully be inspired to do things differently. Um, I think we'll feel stuck if we base our, our future plans or our future business models on a former reality. And I think it's a great time to be using our imagination and, and setting our own rules and kind of imagining a, a different normality um, and the different ways that there are to live a more balanced and purposeful life. Um, in the first webinar, I think after the lockdown, um, Debbie talked about pivoting uh, your business model to adapt to the current environment, which was super interesting. And I know there was also a session with Lynn Blades on pivoting under pressure. So I don't really want to talk too much about pivoting. Um, hopefully everyone's heard enough, but I think it is a really important way of looking at things rather than seeing this time as the end of the world. It could be the start of a new chapter if we just look at it from a different perspective. Um, another thing is I think it's really important to go back to basics. And I think if you're self-employed, um, it's a good time to think, is your purpose aligned with the core of your business? You know, why did you set it up in the first place? Was it maybe to improve people's health or well-being? Was it to make people's lives easier or more convenient? Um, this is a really good time, I think, to go back to your original business idea, check milestone markers and how to adapt, not just for now, but for the future. So why is purpose so important now? Um, well, people have been talking about purpose for a while. Um, I know that we, since we've been going for the last um, nearly 18 months, um, it's become more and more on the agenda for a lot of um, individuals, leaders, and businesses. Um, I'll talk, this more, talk about it more in a, in a business context um, shortly, but I think it's more important now than ever. Um, and I think just a couple of points that I wanted to highlight at the beginning is that it's really important to note that focusing on your purpose now won't only help you to get through this difficult time, but also when things return to normal, whatever normal is, um, it will also help you to be stronger, more resilient and better positioned to reap the rewards. I think you have to do, the other thing is that you have to do what's right for, for you and for your business. But I think it's also important to remember about society and your local community, what you can be doing, because what you do now really will have an impact on your brand and reputation in the future, whether that's your personal brand or your professional corporate brand. Um, I think it has to be about that wider conversation rather than just focusing on yourself. So the big question, how do you find your true purpose at such a difficult time? Um, and I just want to caveat it here that I'm not a life coach. And so um, I wanted to talk a bit about, you know, finding your, your personal purpose. Obviously, we work in more of a, a business purpose context, but I do think they're inextricably um, interlinked. So I did just want to say, um, you know, a bit at the beginning here in terms of how you can really find your purpose. And there's a few prompting questions here um, that will hopefully get you thinking. Um, so firstly, what's the problem you want to address? Um, and I think here it's about, you know, finding your purpose is about understanding what kind of problem you want to solve and what change you want to bring about. Um, the second thing is, how can you drive positive change? Well, you need to identify where you can make a difference and how you can make, um, how you can use your purpose to have a positive impact. And I think it's important to remember here, you know, obviously there are big issues out there. I'm not saying that everyone has to go out and solve climate change. Um, you can choose something smaller and closer to your heart. Um, but it's just something that, um, that you feel passionate about, that you really think that you can make a difference. Um, we work with a lot of social entrepreneurs, for example, um, and they are constantly looking for solutions to um, specific community-based problems, maybe where they see that there's um, a social gap or an injustice. Um, so I think that's sometimes a good place to start. Uh, the third question I think is very important. How do you balance purpose and profit? Um, that's the big question. Um, so obviously you want to do something um, you're passionate about um, and that will make a positive difference in the world, but you also have to be realistic about how to pay the bills. Um, I think you need to find the right business model that suits you, that balances that purpose and that positive uh, social impact with financial viability and commercial success. Um, and the last question is, is really how you stay true to yourself. And I think this is really important, um, this whole idea of congruence. Um, if you follow your passion, then inevitably it will lead you to your purpose. But I think if you lose sight of that, um, and then you start pursuing something that's somebody else's passion or because it, you think it's going to make a lot of money, ultimately you won't really succeed. And it, I don't think it will certainly make, will make you happy in the long run. Um, 
So how does your personal purpose feed into your professional purpose? And as I said, I think the two are interlinked, which is why I wanted to talk about both of them today. Um, here are some of the society's big challenges, I think, as some of the ones that we're dealing with with a lot of our clients at the moment. Um, and I think these are all, of it, all uh, big issues for corporates, but I think also they're issues that many of us will feel passionate about as individuals. Um, not just individuals, but also as consumers, employees, entrepreneurs and investors. Um, you know, things like uh, gender equality, mental health, social mobility. These are all issues that are probably close to our heart. Um, unfortunately, due to a lot of government failings in many countries at the moment, uh, I think we find that businesses and CEOs are really stepping in to fill a gap and address these issues, whether it's alone as a single business, together as an industry or across sectors, um, and I think, you know, having varying levels of, of success. So I think you see that individual purpose really feeds into collective purpose, which ultimately leads to collective action. And I think this is something we're really seeing at the moment with COVID-19. So whether you're self-employed, building your own business, scaling a startup or working within a large organization, I think you can make a really positive impact with your purpose. Um, I think it's worth pointing out here, I just wanted to sort of remind people um, and talk about you know, the trends from CSR to purpose. Um, because when we talk about you know, solving big issues, I think sometimes it can be confused with philanthropy or corporate social responsibility. And I think over the last probably five years or so, we've seen the trend shifting from CSR to purpose. Um, and I think what's important to note here, you can sort of see some of the, the trends um, or, or the, the characteristics of CSR versus um, purpose or social purposes, as, as we call it. Um, and I think there's a couple of things I wanted to point out here. So the fact that purpose is integral to, to your business model, um, it's not really a nice to have, which I think CSR was traditionally seen to be sort of as an add on. Um, and I think purpose is very much um, an integral part of your business. And I think also relevant here is the point about um, joint company and community value creation, which again comes back to, to the kind of the moment we're at, the moment where it's very much focused on uh, being part of a community. So here we are in this, uh, we call this the age of purpose. Um, and I think it's really interesting because companies are, are now expected to demonstrate that they are part of the conversation about, uh, about these big issues that we're talking about. And they really need to take a stand on issues, whether it's climate change, gender equality, ethnic equality, um, and I think we've seen uh, definitely over the last couple of years, companies really starting to put uh, if purpose, if not before, then at least alongside profit. Um, we've seen letters from uh, Larry Fink at BlackRock um, to his investors, to his um, uh, to, the, to his clients. Uh, we've seen the Business Roundtable in the US and uh, the FT with its new agenda. I think a lot of um, a lot of organisations, whether that's media organisations, businesses, are really um, getting to grips with the idea of purpose and embracing it. Um, and so I think that's why purpose isn't just for your own personal fulfilment, but also for the success of your business. And I think it's important to remember when we talk about being, you know, purpose-driven um, business, that it's actually um, it can really power uh, your business goals and actually leads to a, a, a success and actually benefits your bottom line. Um, you know, you've got things here like um, it energizes your employees, builds a positive culture, you can attract investors, uh, really makes your, your brand stand out and it really helps to win the war for talent. And I think it's really important to remember these, that um, these are all, you know, driven by your purpose. Um, but of course there are some barriers. It's a very crowded space and um, I think everyone's talking um, well, at the moment, particularly about COVID, but in general about their purpose. And uh, there's so many things that people want to be saying. Um, and so we have the thing called the three A's, which is articulation, attention, and authenticity. And it really is about how you can stand out. Um, do you know what to say, how, how to say it? Will you be heard? Will you stand out? And most importantly, the authenticity point, will you be believed? Um, I think this is really important to avoid um, purpose washing, which I think we're hearing more and more about at the moment. So how do you do purpose well? Um, well, for us, it comes down to, to these things that we've identified that I think is really helpful in terms of just remembering when you're looking to, to work on your purpose agenda. Um, and a couple of the key points that I just wanted to pull out here is, um, as I mentioned before, the purpose has to be aligned to the core of your business. Um, you have to be authentic. I don't know it's an overused word, but it is really important. Um, I think also focusing on a singular challenge is really important. I think there's so many things that um, we could be talking about and could be going out there um, taking a stand on. Uh, but as an organization, um, you don't want to be spread too thinly. I think it's very important to just focus on one thing. Um, 
and transparency and honesty. Um, I've worked in communications for about um, 13 years. Um, so that's uh, something that I've always talked about with my clients in terms of um, keeping, keeping things as open and honest as possible rather than uh, veering into the territory of spin. Um, so doing purpose uh, well is important, uh, particularly now, but also particularly for certain demographics. And I've got some data here that I wanted to share. I, don't, I won't bore you with, all, uh, with the whole report, but we did just re recently conduct some research, um, which is called the Purpose Pulse, uh, which you can find on, on our website. Um, and it was really on how millennial and Gen Z consumers, employees and activists will shape the world in the years ahead. Um, and they're particularly, it's a particularly important demographic um, because uh, millennials and Gen Z will actually make up almost two thirds of the global population. So um, I think businesses are starting to take note more, much more of the purpose agenda. And I think this is being driven by this new demographic. Um, so the research was carried out. We published it in February. So it was before COVID-19, um, although we're looking to do an update um, soon, hopefully. Um, but I think there were just a few key findings that I wanted to share with you. Um, the first one is um, here in terms of what the, what the key concerns are. And climate change obviously is, is top of the agenda. But I think it's interesting to note that they're both, uh, that's closely followed by challenges such as economic inequality. Um, you've got home ownership in there and job security. Um, and I think all of these will be exacerbated by the current crisis, to be honest. Uh, this is an interesting one. I wanted to raise this because it's um, about talent. And I think, um, you know, it's really interesting to, to know, I think we've, we found from the research that uh, women in ethnic minority groups are more likely to be drawn to companies that demonstrate a clear social purpose. So you can see various different charts here, but 59% uh, of women and 69% of um, black, black British and mixed respondents so that it was really important to have um, a clear social purpose beyond making a profit. So I think when you're looking for um, a, a diverse workforce, it's definitely appealing for them. Um, oh, sorry, something. There we go, sorry. Just uh, lost my slide there for a minute. Can everyone see that okay, hopefully? Um, so then the next one is about um, uh, the majority, which is about 55% have said that they have a clear purpose beyond profit, which was important to them when selecting which brand to buy. So again, if you've got um, uh, an organization where you're selling brands, um, you're selling products, and I think having a clear purpose is very important to, to consumers. Um, and the last one that I wanted to share with you on the data side um, was um, about supporting companies. And here it shows that six in 10, uh, so about 61% told us that it was important or very important that companies take a stance on the issues that matter to them. Um, and actually, if you can see maybe in the fourth line down, I think, um, having a clear social purpose is there. And that's just as important as equal pay, which I think is quite impressive. And the fact that it's nearly as important um, as being transparent, which is the top. Um, item on there on the priorities. So, um, what has been the business response to COVID nineteen, and ha and have companies really been driven by purpose or by profit? Um, I think businesses have really been tested like never before, and how they respond now um, will not only impact how they survive the crisis, but they'll reshape the relationship between business and society when we come out of this. Um, people are tracking companies, and we'll hold them to account. And when they reopen, people will either support or boycott them, uh, depending on how they behave during this time. I'm sure everyone's seen the good guys and bad guys list circulating on Twitter. Um, also came across a website called didtheyhelp.com, um, which apparently you can enter in a company name or even a celebrity and see how they behave during the pandemic. Um, so people are definitely being, being held to account. Um, so what can we learn from the business response um, so far? I think uh, we've sort of identified here, and I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to my co-founder, Barry Johnston. He actually wrote an article, which um, again, you can find on our website or on LinkedIn, um, talking about the COVID crisis and, and how businesses have responded and, and how purposeful they've been. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the themes that, that he mentioned, uh, which are loyalty, leadership, innovation, and honesty. And then I'm going to go through with some, some case studies to kind of um, make it a bit more tangible. So I think loyalty is, is super important. And this is basically about how you treat your staff, which has become a litmus test for corporate purpose. Um, it's no good donating to a food bank if your employees are the ones using it. Uh, we're seeing, you know, a lot of companies are having to, to make people redundant or, or furloughing them. Um, and I'm sure we'll see uh, much more debate about living wages and sick pay, um, especially for contractors and freelancers after this. 
Um, leadership, uh, leadership really matters at this time. Uh, we're seeing some companies are tightening their belts at the top, um, either cutting senior management pay um, or halting dividends instead of laying off employees, which I think is, is very, very widely well received um, and praised. Innovation, I think this is a really important one, and this is interesting because um, you've seen companies really need to adapt to make sure that their products and services can be used for the greater good. Philanthropy is great, and a lot of organizations are doing that. Supermarkets are donating to food banks, which is fantastic. But I think being more innovative is, is what's gonna make them really um, stand out um, and is gonna be much more appreciated. Um, so again, supermarkets changing their business hours, prioritizing vulnerable customers and NHS staff. Uh, you've got some tech companies that have dropped charges or extended access to their products, especially around things like home learning. Um, and luxury manufacturers who are now, uh, have shifted their manufacturing uh, product lines uh, to produce ventilators, hand sanitizer, and NHS gowns. And the last one is honesty. So again, uh, I'm gonna mention open and honest communication is absolutely essential. Being transparent is the most important thing um, for building trust between brands and consumers. Um, We've seen that in the research, as I say, with millennials and Gen Z, but I think that's the same for any generation. And I think that companies that say one thing but do another will definitely be found out. Um, so here are some examples. I want to just kind of bring it to life a bit with some case studies. Um, uh, many organizations have come under fire for mistreating or laying off their staff with no warning um, around this time. Uh, and obviously there have been some organizations that have really gone out on a limb for their, for their employees and have been really praised for their loyalty. Um, so I've got going to have a look at the, at the bad guys first and then a look at the good guys. Um, so um, we'll start off with Weatherspoons. maybe, you'll see that there. It's essentially my local one in South East London where um, somebody graffitied pay your staff on it. Um, uh, they've provided very little support to their employees as they were laid off uh, or their hours were cut and they even said they wouldn't be able to pay some of the employees for the work hours that they'd already worked. So there was a, a lot of negative press for them, which I'm sure that you saw in the media. Um, uh, another one who received a lot of bad press was Britannia Hotels, who not only fired their staff, uh, you can see a letter here in the right hand corner, um, but they evicted them from their accommodation with no notice and no redundancy pay. Um, and then Sports Direct and, and Waterstones, um, they were both, uh, both of their CEOs decided to stay open past the requested lockdown. Um, and they claimed that um, their goods, so fitness equipment and books were actually essential goods, which I mean, I have to say, probably we are all reading and exercising more at this time. But in terms of looking after your staff, certainly a lot of them were, were on the sales floor without the right uh, uh, protection and felt very vulnerable. Um, and I think in, that, in those circumstances, they should have thought about their staff rather than their customers first. Who are the good guys? Um, so m and have been following closely um, and I think they've done a fantastic job in terms of looking after their staff. Um, they've given them not only been paying them well but they've also given them a 15 percent pay increase um as well as looking after their staff they've, they've closed their clothes shops they've moved people over to the food department so that people aren't overworked there uh, they've also donated food and i think easter eggs uh, last weekend to the nhs uh, they've created clear clothing care packs uh, for nhs nightingale patients so they're really going out not just to look after their employees but also that loyalty to customers um, and potential customers as well um, and Gap and Asda, so Gap was, um, they closed their stores early and committed to giving employees full pay for the entirety of the lockdown. Um, and Asda has given all vulnerable employees uh, full pay to self-isolate as well. Um, in terms of the leadership side of things, I think, um, you know, individuals and boards heading up companies are really facing more pressure than ever to support their staff and their communities and the wider world around them. Um, and people have turned to C-suite leadership really for that reassurance and assistance. So it's, it's really important in these kind of times of crisis that leaders take real action um, and they live up to their promises. Um, so we've got here uh, the new Unilever CEO, Alan Job. Um, he promised to pay his employees and contractors and others on a full part-time basis. Um, the Hilton CEO, Chris Nassetta, um, he actually connected workers from temporarily suspended hotels uh, with hundreds of um, thousands of short-term jobs at companies like Amazon that remain open. And then he's pledged to hire them all back as soon as possible. Um, and then as well as the internal policies and looking after their staff, I think they've taken a lot more, um, a lot of CEOs, particularly in the tech sector, um, have, have sort of pledged wider assistance. So you've got um, Microsoft CEO and Tesla CEO really sort of, you know, filling voids by, by offering uh, medical supplies and technology. 
Um, and of course, um, uh, Apple and Google have just announced about developing the COVID tracker, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on your views on privacy laws. Um, and then um, we come to innovation. Um, so I think several companies are supporting the fight um, to beat coronavirus by ensuring their products and services can be harnessed for their collective effort. Um, many companies are really going the extra mile to adapt their business and offer any resources they have to, to support the cause. Um, I think supermarkets, as I say, have done a great job, um, particularly we've got Iceland here, so opening their store hours um, for vulnerable people, and making donations to, to food banks and charities. I think Iceland was the first one to, to talk about opening hours, um, uh, changing their opening hours um, earlier. Um, we've got luxury brands, so um, LVMH, Burberry, um, Ferrari, they all changed their manufacturing lines. So, so LVMH is now making hand sanitizer, Burberry, uh, surgical gowns, uh, Ferrari's making ventilators. Um, Mercedes is another one, they, they just announced they're making breathing aids in collaboration with UCL. Uh, Brewdog is another one that make, is making hand sanitizers. Um, and then I just wanted to include the, the PrEP one here, because I think even though it's not necessarily um, pulling together for a collective effort, it is um, being innovative in thinking in terms of, okay, how can we help people and, and how can we help the NHS? And I think they were one of the first ones then together with Leon, uh, really one of the first ones to kind of offer, offer you know, discounted drinks, um, free food, et cetera. Um, and I think that really um, helped to set the tone of other, um, particularly in those industry, um, in, the, in the food and drink industry, uh, but in other industries as well to see what they could do to support the NHS and others and other key workers. Um, and then honesty. So I think through all of these themes, there is definitely a common thread. And I think companies have to be open and honest about above all else. Um, if they don't, then false promises will be judged very swiftly and brutally. Um, so we've got a few examples here. So Travelodge, um, they agreed to help the government house homeless people during the lockdown, but then they turned them out on the street with no alternative accommodation which was not great. Um, McDonald's in the UK said to staff that they would stay open for takeaways, then 24 hours later announced all the stores would be closed. Um, and actually to make matters worse, I think most of the staff members actually found out via social media. Um, so not particularly good internal communications there. Um, and Virgin, I think um, Richard Branson's had a bit of a rough ride. He asked staff to take um, eight weeks of unpaid leave. Um, but then he asked the government uh, for a 500 million pound bailout. He's actually only injecting about 5% of his per personal wealth into the Virgin Group uh, to keep it afloat. I think there was a rather unflattering article in, in the Guardian about, about it recently, a few days ago. And I think, um, again, sort of offering one thing and, and changing your mind and not being totally transparent um, is just, is not, is, not, um, is not appreciated at this time. Um, I think, but on the other hand, you know, many organisations have been applauded for following through on pledge support to both their staff and, and local communities. And I just think it's crucial in this time when there's so much uncertainty, that organisations um, make, only make promises that they can keep and really prioritise giving back over cutting costs. So is one thing being purpose driven in the current environment, but how can we be purposeful after COVID-19? Um, Personally, I don't think I'm the only one either. I don't think things will return to normal. Um, I think there's going to be a big shift. Um, I think this, as I said, this has been a time for, for a lot of reflection for a lot of people. Um, and I don't think we can really return to, to how things were, where you know, bankers were more valued than nurses, where supermarket workers were seen as disposable, unskilled workers, where people were commuting hours into work every day instead of working remotely just as effectively from home, and where it's acceptable to jump on a plane for a one hour meeting. I think it's going to be a different kind of capitalism, what we call stakeholder capitalism, um, which is much more about um, all members of society being involved. And I think it's going to be a different kind of society, um, which will really help to create a more balanced, healthier, more climate conscious, community focused world. And I think that's better for everyone. Um, and I just wanted to end on this slide because I thought it was a nice one to help us reflect. Um, you've probably all seen it on somewhere on social media, but I just think it helps us to remind us what our priorities should be and what the possibilities for our future now that we've experienced such a different way of life. Um, it's important to take what we've learned during this time um, and make sure that the next chapter of our lives is really motivated by our passion and our purpose so that we can create a better world, not just for ourselves, but for society. And that's it. Um, so, um, 
I'll just ch so check in the chat messages, see if anyone's, I've just kept my half an hour timeline, I think, as per um, Courtney's request. So I think we've got about 10 minutes or so for, for any questions. I'm just looking in the chat box and um, I've just uh, seen a couple of messages from people um, asking to share the slides. Yes, I can certainly share the slides. I'm not sure how I'll do that, but I'll liaise with Courtney and we'll see. Um, I think there'll be a recording and I think um, there'll be sort of follow-up notes, etc. So we'll see about that. Um, I don't have any questions on it. Oh, here we go. There's a question. Um, so from D, thank you very much, D. Um, how do you think the need for travel will be balanced post-COVID? Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And that was kind of one of the points that I wanted to make in the, in the last slide about, um, you know, traveling everywhere for meetings and for work. And I think, um, I think climate change is, is it very inextricably linked with, with COVID and with the reaction afterwards. And I think we've been talking about this a lot with a lot of our clients that um, even though people were talking about, you know, Greta and a lot of activists were talking about the climate emergency, nobody really took it seriously. And this is actually a crisis and a, and a, and a real emergency. And it's just made everybody stop in their tracks and totally change all of their habits. And so I think it would be a real shame if afterwards people didn't then take in what we've experienced and we've learned and just go back to the old habits. And I think it's, it's unlikely that people will. Um, so I'd, I'd like, I'd hope that, um, I'd hope that, that, you know, the need to travel, I think it's really important. I think we've all seen that we can do a lot of stuff through technology. We can be in, in touch online, um, which is great, but I think we're all missing the personal face-to-face -face contact. And I think there's certain things that maybe some meetings we can do online, but some things, some events, et cetera, um, like the Albright events, um, they're great to do in person. It's great for networking. It's great to have that, uh, that personal connection. So I think it will just be finding the right balance of, uh, do we really need to be traveling all the time? Or can we just maybe prioritize where, where we need to be traveling and when? Um, okay, so another few questions. Um, share the list of bad, good, and bad companies. Yes, I can do that, Rachel, no problem. Um, any advice for where this is from Rebecca? Uh, oh, this is a private one, so maybe I'll follow up with this separately. Um, Another one from Rachel. Um, what drove you to work in the arena of social purpose and social impact? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I was working in, um, I didn't kind of give too much of an explanation at the beginning because I just wanted to get into the, into the context. But I think um, I was working um, in communications, so corporate communications, financial communications for um, about 12 years, uh, working for different agencies. And um, in the last um, year or so, I started to work more in um, so sustainability and social purpose within a bigger agency. Um, and I think I was working a lot with uh, financial services clients and natural resources clients, a lot of whom are facing a lot of challenges um, when you've got sort of private equity co companies and mining companies. And I think I, I struggle with a bit of um, some of the work that they were doing and some of the ethics around it and I just thought that it was much more important to focus on the social purpose side of things um, and to um, together with with Lewis we were one of my co-founders we were working together um, and we basically decided to set up our own agency to just focus purely on that and I think um, as I said that was probably about 18 months ago and I think it's it's been a really interesting time where it really um, social purpose and social impact has really been on the agenda for a lot of a lot of organizations um how do you think this is from marta how do you think health will change women's health postnatal care and is virtual the new platform this is a really good question actually um um yes well i'm actually pregnant at the moment and i'm having to do um all of my appointments i said to go to the midwife um which is just about the only person i can see in person at the moment um and so yeah i think it's quite interesting actually from that perspective to see um, obviously all the antenatal classes have been cancelled uh, they're going to move everything online so I do yeah I think a lot of things will be moved online again I think it's a shame um, I think certain things around women's health it's, it's great to have that connection um, with other women and, and particularly with, with doctors um, and healthcare professionals so I think there's certain things as I say some of the resources and some of the classes they can do online um, but I think um, I think some of it will be important to, to still keep in person uh, but I have to say, I'm not a health expert, so um, so I, I can't go into too much detail about that. Um, oh, and then Rebecca said she can, you can ask the, her question to the whole group. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So any advice for when you want to progress social purpose for your company, but you get resistance from senior members or lack of desire from peers to take on board of uh, take on board the role of social purpose? Yeah, this is this is a really good question. And I think the whole idea of um, social purpose, I think in certain organizations, um, it really is welcomed and really taken on board. And some there's there's definite pushback in terms of um, is this really necessary? And it seems like a, little, it's a lot of time. Does it really help the bottom line? Um, I think we've had that before with a lot of a lot of um, a lot of clients or potential clients. And I would say the the trick that I've found really is is getting that buy-in, that senior buy-in from the top. If you have, you know, you look at an organisation like Unilever, for example, um, and you have Paul Polman just drilling into people, you know, and cascading it down throughout the organisation, and every single person I've met who works for Unilever or who has worked there, just it, it has that kind of purpose mantra indoctrinated, not indoctrinated, that sounds very negative, but, you know, it's kind of, it's it's embedded, and um, they really, you know, they really believe in it, and it's, um, it's very important, it's an essential part of their, their business. And I think if you have that um, leadership from the top, then it, it filters down and everyone within the organization really does um, does get on board with it. I think um, going in, it depends on when you're going in, whether you're going in sort of on a, on a comms level, a CFO level, I think trying to get any sort of, um, any financial, uh, um, you know, CFO, CFO type people to get on board with it is very tricky because they are just going to be looking at the numbers. And this is, it's quite sort of intangible, at least at the beginning, um, to really um, be able to prove that it's really going to help the bottom line. Um, and I think it's, um, it's something, yeah, it's something that we, that we face a lot. I think getting that senior buy-in is just really important. And whether that's the strategy, you know, as I say, CEO or strategy or COO, um, because I think, um, if you try and if you try and kind of filter at mid level, it's very difficult. The other thing I would just say is what we don't what we've been doing quite a lot with with clients is creating a purpose council. So if you can't get in at the top, um, try and get in at the bottom. And as I say, look, you know, millennials and Gen Z they're the ones who are really driving the purpose agenda. So if you have that, um, you know, sort of we've had a purpose council across the world. So you have different people um, in different offices who are talking about purpose and who are driving the purpose agenda and they create a council and they have um, decisions about how to be a purpose-led business that align with the business goals. And then they go to their respective countries and departments and filter that up. And then that kind of filters up. So I think that's a helpful way um, maybe to move it upwards within the organization. Um, could you recommend, this is from Pippa, could you recommend any websites um, or articles to read about social purpose and how to perhaps get involved working in that space? Yes. Um, uh, there, I feel like there's so much out there at the moment. I'm digesting loads. So maybe I can get your details and just, um, and maybe sort of send you some, some thoughts. Um, I would say maybe have a look at our website to start with because we've got some articles on there um, and it maybe also give, give some references to some other, other places, but I'll have a think and maybe put together a, um, a reading list. Um, uh, from Debbie, do you think um, COVID-19 is actually exacerbating purpose wash? I find many brands jumping on the bandwagon and communicating the same messages and doing similar things to try and show they're acting with purpose, but it's not authentic to their brand. Yeah, I think this is this is really true. And I think um, when I was looking through, you know, we were kind of going through the case studies. Um, there are a lot of companies that wanted to highlight things like Pret, where they, you know, went out there first and did something um, different. But then I think, yeah, there is that kind of jumping on the bad whack and idea. Um, I think if they are, as long as they're doing something good um, and helping society, helping local communities, I don't have a problem with it. If they are pretending to be uh, very purpose driven and are not and are actually, um, you know, whether they're damaging or, um, or not helping employees or, or, or um, customers, et cetera, um, then I think that's, that's where there's an issue. Um, but I know I have seen a, lot, a few things on, there was a, a video the other day of sort of um, somebody talking about the, the, you know, the amount of purpose washing from brands. I think that that is a bit of a problem, but again, I think it comes out in terms of, when we come out of this, um, which are the brands that were really that were really authentic about it? And I think people are quite good at being able to tell now which are the authentic ones um, and which are not. And I think people they will be judged quite harshly afterwards. Um, and I think 
I think that's it. If anyone, if I haven't answered anyone's questions enough or correctly, feel, feel free to, to ping me again, or if there's any other um, questions you have. And also, um, I've got my email address there on the last slide, which hopefully you can see. Um, or if you want to get in touch with, with Courtney, I'm sure that she can follow up with, um, with my details. Um, and I'm super happy to answer any questions. I think it's a, it's a really interesting time at the moment. Um, I think it's um, very difficult for a lot of people, but as I said, I think it's a real time for opportunity to just really think about, okay, is this, is this the kind of world that we want to go back to? Or, and what is the kind of world we want to go back to? And I do think, as I say, it's about your personal purpose, it's about your professional purpose, and really how we can use both to, to create a better world without saying something too idealistic. <laughs> um, Great, so I think I'm done. I think I've kept to my, to my scheduled time, Courtney. Yes, perfect. Thank you. That was so interesting. Thank you so, so much. Um, obviously, there was tons and tons of questions um, and it has stayed within the 40 minutes, which is really great because it means that we anything over 40 minutes means that we can't, uh, we, the file doesn't save. Um, so we can't upload it to Albright Connect for people to view afterwards. But as we are within that time slot, we can. So I will be uploading this um, to Albright Connect and then um, you can view it there. But um, also, Daniela, obviously, if anyone asks for your details, um, I'll post this. If it's okay with you, I can pass them on. Yes, please do. Thank you so much. Perfect. Have a lovely day. And yeah, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks to everyone for joining. Have a good day.